thanks very much, Chris, for a brilliant talk and a sort of terrible build-up because um, he kept saying, oh, you get a lot more science from me, and in fact, you won't at all. There's far more science in Chris's talk than you get from mine because although it's true that my personal, as it were, professional interest is in malarial immunology, I'm not going to talk about malarial immunology. Given the, um, the, the brief I was given to talk about sort of more historical context, I'm going to talk about malaria in a, in a, broader, in a broader context. And I was a bit horrified, actually, to be asked to talk about the history um, or to have a historical element, because I remember from uh, sort of all through my career, I've always thought, God, I hope I'm never the guy who gets so old and doddery that they ask them to talk about history. Um, <laughs> and it was even more of a shock to realise that what I'm going to talk about has actually all taken place in my professional career. So it's not even sort of from reading backwards. It's, uh, nonetheless, it's, uh, that's what I'm going to give. It's at least some sort of historical context. Um, uh, when I talk about malaria, I'm not largely going to distinguish between falciparum and bivax, um, either because what I say will broadly apply to both, or if it doesn't, then I'm largely going to talk about falciparum. And I will also have quite a focus on Africa for reasons which will become apparent as we go on. But I think, as everyone recognises, malaria is a global problem. And as Chris showed, um, sort of 60 or 70 years ago, it would have extended considerably outside these ranges. But of course, this kind of pattern, as we've heard, doesn't this kind of picture doesn't really give you a, a picture of what's going on. You have to look more, and you've seen this already in a different format, look at parasite density. Obviously, uh, by density, I mean the sort of frequency of being parasitized in the population. Um, and um, the point's already been made that this is enormously more so in Africa. But even this doesn't really give you a picture of the problem um, unless you take account of population. And then you find out that sort of malaria uh, is essentially a problem of both Africa and South Asia. And the South Asia one at first is a bit puzzling because if you sort of remember the previous slide, whoops, can't do that. Um, uh, it sort of South Asia doesn't look very striking. Um, but the issue, of course, is there's loads of people in South Asia. And so if you're looking at sort of just number of episodes, South Asia is really important. But nonetheless, 90% of mortality due to malaria is still, in Af is still in Africa. And that's the reason why I will not concentrate on Africa, but a lot of what I say will be about Africa. And as Chris has made the point, unlike most of the rest of the world, the problem in Africa is essentially in children. Severe malaria, whether it's cerebral malaria or severe malarial anemia, as shown here, largely affects young children. And that's not the case in most parts of the world, where malaria is ev either evenly distributed or often is much more predominant in, in older populations and mortality is higher in older populations. And the reason for this, of course, is that where malaria is transmitted um, heavily or endemically, uh, you, do, you do develop immunity to malaria. So immunity to, to malaria is shown here, where you've got the age of a population, um, <laughs> Again, talking about age, I drew this graph first about 25 years ago, where it was unimaginable that you'd consider what happened after 50. Now I've, now I've got to sort of revise this, <laughs> although I, I'm pleased to hear from Chris that apparently sex can be expected at older ages, but um, I, I shall look forward to that. Um, uh, the, the, um, and this is the proportion of whatever it is you're talking about. So in green is severe, is it, uh, severe malaria, i.e. malaria which may lead to death. Bluish is malaria, which is <laughs> often called mild malaria. I also think this is a kind of complete mis misnomer. Those of people who've had so-called mild malaria will know that if you're not going to die from it, you feel as if you wish you would, because, I mean, it can be quite severe. And then there's parasitization. But what it, however you look at malaria, over time, you do become immune to it. And the key point, of course, is that you stop dying of it relatively early. So in endemic areas of Africa, it has always been the case, this will change, as, has been, as Chris mentioned, it has always been the case that if you, if you get basically past five or six, you're not going to die of malaria. And that's why the problem is essentially in children. And this is going to be very important. I'll make a, a reference to this uh, later on at the end of the talk. So malaria at the turn of the century um, was often characterised, and this wasn't hyperbole, often these things are hyperbole, but this wasn't the case. At the turn of the century, malaria could really be described as having been a disaster. No one knew how many deaths there were. They still don't, by the way, so don't take too seriously the uh, numbers that you see. But no one knew how many deaths there were, but it was somewhere probably between one and three million, and probably it was higher rather than lower. There was failing drugs, uh, widespread drug resistance, initially to chloroquine and then to other drugs. 
the complete lack or failure of national and international will, it seemed. Um, and malaria was a major economic uh, impediment to development. And in fact, the sort of very I've always found this very interesting. So here, shown here is the malaria specific mortality per thousand children in pre um, independence Africa, uh, sort of before the 1960s, then in the period immediately afterwards, up until 1989, and then subsequently. And you can see that in, after independence, most African countries um, <coughs> actually were doing pretty well in getting on top of malaria mortality. Now, whether they were getting on top of it or whether something else was happening, but it's certainly the case that malaria-specific mortality was falling. But then, by 1990s, it had come right back up and in many cases was worse than it had ever been in colonial history. Uh, and of course, during colonial times, in many places, not very much was being done about malaria outside urban situations. So it really had gone completely out of control by the 1990s. And because of that, um, a whole set of international initiatives began to take place. Uh, RBM, Rollback Malaria, was formed in 1998. Then there are a number of public-private partnerships, uh, particularly Medicines for Malaria Venture, recognising that new tools were needed. There's the Abuja Declaration. Heads of states, uh, of African heads of states, made a declaration that malaria mortality will be halved by, um, um, <coughs> by now, essentially. And then the formation of the Global Fund. And there was a lot of, I think, initially justified scepticism by many people as to whether this was just all words. You know, people in many areas have heard about sort of all the good intentions, international action and so forth. And uh, I think in particular, researchers often do tend to be... Um, well, I think it's important to draw a distinction between sceptical and cynical. Perhaps sometimes they're too cynical. We should always be sceptical, but not, perhaps not cynical. And certainly for many of us, I think what actually happened after this renewed sort of focus on malaria was actually very revealing and very important and pretty heartening in some ways. Because what actually happened was that global expenditure on malaria, malaria control sort of grew initially exponentially. It really quite extraordinary to go from 2004 to where it was by 2010. It had gone up in log order. So these are in, um, so this is uh, in uh, sort of multiply up, this is um, $2.5 billion. Um, so it did go up enormously, so it wasn't just worse. There was a bit of a lag. It took a few years after, after the formation of those things, but then it really shot up. Enormous increase in expenditure. What did that spending go on? Well, it went on many things, but essentially it went on two major things. One was drugs, um, um, particularly Artemis in combination. So this is, again, same timeline, 2005 now to 2013. Don't worry about what the different brands are. These are essentially deliveries of combination therapy across the world. And again, it's an absolutely extraordinary increase in the availability of good drugs. The second thing, of course, that money was spent on were bed nets. And again, and this is from, uh, you see a lot of data from sort of MAP and Simon's group here, but this is in the, in the recent uh, World Malaria Report, but taken <coughs> I, I, from the Malaria Atlas project. This is the availability of bed nets in Africa. Um, so either with access to or sleeping under. And again, in 2000, at the turn of the century, it was essentially nil. I, now, this is extraordinary as well. But, I mean, Chris pointed out to several scandalous things about malaria. I think it's one of the most scandalous. It was well known by 2000 that bed nets were probably the most effective public health intervention ever. And yet, they just simply weren't there. Now, there's been an extraordinary increase, but it's also, it depends whether you're a glass half, full or half empty person, but uh, it has been an extraordinary increase. But it's also striking that there's still a long way to go. Only half the people are under nets. Uh, only half who should be are. But nonetheless, it's a really striking development. Did this have any effect? You would hope so. You would hope that sort of a log order increase in funding um, and distribution of effective treatment and effective prevention would have an effect. And shown here, again from the recent malaria, um, uh, uh, World Malaria Report, is an indication of the reduction in um, the frequency of parasitites in a population, if you like. And it's one of those where you just have to sort of squint your eyes up and get the overall impression. Dark is lots of malaria parasites, light, and it's obvious that over a period um, between the turn of the century and a couple of years ago, there's obviously a kind of continuing reduction. And, and Chris has made the, this point previously. Uh, shown in another way in, in a recent paper from Abdus Salam Noor, um, one of my colleagues in Kenya. This is looking at the sort of 
population adjusted parasite rates in 2000 versus 2010 for all the countries in Africa, size of the problem reflected in the size of the circle. And, what, and obviously, if nothing changed, you'd be on the diagonal. And what you can see is, in many countries, have experienced a really quite striking reduction in simply the number of children in that age range being parasitized. So all these below the line, there's been a reduction. Reductions to different degrees, and even in this under low transmission here, expanded here, the same thing is happening. So this is across the board, at all levels of transmission, there's a general reduction in, in being parasitized and therefore in transmission, but not everywhere. There are plenty still on the line, haven't shifted at all, and in Malawi's case, things for some reason appear to have got worse. So although we talk about malaria going down, and this is probably true continentally, it's not true absolutely everywhere. Nonetheless, it's, it's very striking. Particularly striking in, in mortality. So here, if we come back to the world as a whole, this is the percentage change in malaria mortality rates. And basically, blue, the blue is really good. So either there are no malaria deaths or there's been a massive decrease, 75%. Uh, in, but basically, everything except very, very dark brown is good. So malaria deaths have come down worldwide, but they particularly come down in Africa. So overall, it's estimated that malaria mortality in that period of about 13 years has fallen by more than 50% in Africa. That is really extraordinary over that period of time to say the scale of the problem at the turn of the century. I want now to sort of begin to have a look at this in a bit more detail at a local level. So the, what I'm going to show you now are data taken from um, the coast of Kenya, Kalifi, where I've been living for the last 25 years. Uh, for those of you who don't know where it is, it's just on the coast there. Um, and shown here is from 1990 up to about 2010. And this is, it doesn't matter what the scale is. What this actually is, you can just think of it as numbers of cases of severe disease being admitted to the local hospital. It could just as easily be number of deaths, um, but it's essentially severity of disease. <coughs> and it doesn't matter what the scale is, it's, it's the relative, it's what's going on. Now, I was saying I've been living in Kalifi for 25 years, and I was originally there because there was an enormous amount of malaria. Um, and over a period of time, there's been a quite extraordinary change. I think it's hard to explain to people who've not dealt with a lot of malaria what an extraordinary experience it is to, to see a disease which sort of, at certain times of year, is killing literally dozens of children, sometimes several a day on a, on a packed ward, and many of you will have had this experience, to see it become, over a few years, a disease which is relatively rare, the kind of thing that you take visiting medical students to see because it's so unusual. So deaths due to malaria where I've been working haven't reduced by 50%, they've reduced by 90% over a relatively short period of time. Really quite extraordinary experience. So this all looks brilliant. You know, ex international effort, you decide there's a big problem, you mobilise resources, you do something about it, and it's fantastic. Except that's when the bed nets and the ACTs came in. And it's always hard with these kind of things to say, yes, but when did the decline really start? Was that a freak year? Did it start here? Or was this the <coughs> did it start there? Or was it actually pretty much the same to there and drop there? Wherever it began to drop, it would seem that it was well before anything sort of significant was done about it. But you can unpick this a little bit. And that's shown here. So I'll just sort of slightly complicated, but I'll just explain the lines. So same, same figure, essentially, with the, with the um, timing of the interventions. The red line is the community parasite rate reconstructed. So this is uh, actually done by taking the, the parasite rate in children coming into the same ward who come in for trauma, either orthopaedic trauma or other sorts of trauma, or cold surgery. So this reflects the parasite rate, the amount of transmission in the population. It's been dropping steadily for probably 15 to 20 years. The orange is the line, the age of non-malaria positive patients. No reason why you'd expect that to change over time. Whereas yellow is the malaria positive children coming in. You would expect that to change if transmission was going down. Because as transmission goes down, you, have, you acquire immunity less quickly. So the average age of a child with severe malaria will go up. And you can see that if you look at parasite rates in the population or the divergence in age between non-malaria and malaria, however you look at it, this fall in malaria has been happening for 10, 15 years before all the interventions. Now, this is 
This is a story which is familiar in public health. I mean, I'm sure many of you have seen the same figures about TB before um, interventions, but about pneumonia in the developed world before antibiotics. It's not unusual for there to be a big fall way ahead of what we think is actually doing. Now, I have to be really clear here, because I've given this kind of talk before, and at the end of it, despite the fact that at this point I always stop and give a real health warning, and I always say I am not arguing for one second that interventions don't work or aren't important, they're absolutely essential, there's lots of evidence that they're absolutely essential. Um, always at the end somebody comes up to me and says, so you're saying we shouldn't spend so much on interventions, so this is my health warning, I'm not saying that at all. We must not only spend as much as we are doing, we must, as I'll show later, increase it substantially. Nonetheless, it is important to recognise that the fall in malaria, which is taking place in many parts of Africa, is not simply due to intervention. There is something else going on, and it's rather embarrassing to say that we actually have no idea what it is. Um, Chris mentioned the El Nino thing. Well, lots of people sort of put that one up for this. There are many potential reasons, but whatever it is, it's important to know it's happening. Because it's actually giving interventions a helping hand, which is fantastic, but because we don't know what it is, means that we don't know it may not reverse. It may be part of a long-range cyclical phenomenon, but whatever it is, we don't know the root of it. But it's important to know it's happening. Now, you could say well, it's just freakish. It's just something that's happening there on the coast in, uh, in East Africa. It's not. This is Nyaka in Senegal, uh, in a place where, again, there is um, uh, good surveillance of severe disease over time. This is malaria mortality, actually, in a demographic surveillance system. This time, going back to 1984, very familiar for those of you who've just seen the slide from Khalifi, very familiar. Um, and same thing, the decline began way, way ahead of, the in, of, of interventions. Um, also interesting to note that prior, um, if you go much earlier, that probably malaria was that. There probably really was a massive increase due to chloroquine failure. It wasn't just simply that there's always been loads and loads of it, there's always been plenty of malaria. But there probably really was a pre, as it were, <laughs> then a complete failure, then something happened. And then while something has happened, something else has happened. We've put lots of interventions in. And, this, and the more you look at data, even those data that which are claimed to show the effect of intervention, if you, if you look at them carefully, you, all the data I've seen at least from East and West Africa always show this pattern of it falling ahead of interventions. So what's happened to overall mortality? If, um, if malaria is a major cause of childhood death, we might expect that getting on top of malaria, however we're doing it, will have an effect on overall uh, childhood mortality. So again, back to Khalifi now. This is childhood mortality rates uh, per thousand over time from 1990. And it, this has come down like a stone. It's reduced by 75%. And again, something if you told me that was going to happen, I would have said it would have been impossible. And then you say, well, even in the worst settings, malaria only accounts for about a quarter of all the childhood deaths. So maximum expectation, if you got rid of it completely, well, you might get a 25% reduction in, in childhood mortality. But in fact, over this time, there's been a 75%. So one obvious explanation is, well, it's nothing to do with malaria. It's just some sort of general improvement. Health's improving in Africa in general, and that may well be true. But there's very little evidence of it in rural areas when you look at the indicators which you'd expect to sort of change with it. Sort of, so if you look at nutritional status of children in this area, it's not improved at all. If you look at overall socioeconomic status, it's not changed hardly at all. Nonetheless, it's, it's all one can say at this stage is, well, malaria's gone down for reasons we don't fully understand. Overall, childhood mortality has dropped enormously for reasons we don't fully understand. So maybe there's no particular connection between them. If you go and look again in West Africa, so this time it's the Gambia, um, and this is just different places in the Gambia, I won't go into the details, the line tells the story. This is basically malaria going down, so I, I won't go to what the axes are and such like, just to make the point that we move right to the other side of the continent, malaria is also dropping. Um, what's happened to their childhood mortality? Well, this is taken from a demographic site which some of you will know in Parafeni, and again, this is overall childhood mortality over time from 1988, exactly the same, 75% reduction, exactly the same reduction um, as, with, um, as in East Africa. Some quite interesting things there. Chris, Chris made the point that sort of holidays are bad you know, when, when, the, when, the, when the medic's not there, you know, things go worse. What I find the most interesting thing here is that the biggest improvement in childhood mortality was when there was a military coup and reduced foreign aid. Um, <laughs> so if you want to have a real big hit, 
it's obvious what you need to do. This is good news for Chris as well with DFID. I mean, really, really you reduce the foreign aid. It has a fantastic effect. Put the aid back in, mortality goes up again, but then eventually you get back on top of it. But whatever the case, there's been an equivalent drop in childhood mortality in West Africa as well. Could it be, so it's been a long story that malaria actually does cause secondary deaths. Could it really be that malaria is in some way related to these other deaths which are being saved? It's always been really hard to say because the data is so hard to interpret. So what, what um, Bob Stone and I did many years ago was look at the prevalence of parasitemia in a population, which is a measure of the amount of transmission, against the all-cause mortality in children. And the problem is it's all over the place. So you could draw that line, but you could make a plausible argument that the line is like that, i.e. that there may be some indication that the more malaria you've got, the more deaths you've got, disproportionately. There might be something about malaria which, which is worse for children than you imagine. It's not just due to malaria. I think now we're pretty clear that that is true. If you look at what else declines over the same period of time, so again, these are data from Kalithi again, um, and the, uh, the black is the malaria line which you've already seen, these are all um, uh, bacteremia. Um, so overall bacteremia is in blue and then sort of gram-negative in uh, uh, green and so on and so forth. But the message is that over the same period of time, bacteremia of, of major pathogens has fallen by uh, a great degree. Um, and of course, bacteremia kills far more children than malaria ever did. I mean, basically, if you don't die of malaria, to a first approximation, deaths are usually due to febrile illness, and with the exception of a few viruses, that's caused by bacteria. So bacteria are far more important as a cause of death than malaria. And again, you sit behind and say, well, this, yeah, this is just a sign that things are getting better in general. There's some sort of general health improvement. But in fact, we now know that um, that's probably not the explanation. I think everybody knows the sickle cell tray story with malaria. Sickle cell tray, um, uh, essentially an African genetic condition, although not limited to Africa, uh, certainly where uh, African diaspora, but also across Asia. Um, um, but essentially an African condition. And everybody knows the story that if you've um, got sickle cell tray as opposed to sickle cell disease, you are protected against malaria. But a few years ago, we, for reasons that are sort of slightly mixed up, we did a case control study um, and found that sickle cell tray in Kenya, or on the coast of Kenya, gave strong protection against invasive bacterial disease. And this was surprising. And there are only two possibilities, really. It either does genuinely protect against bacterial disease for some biological reason, which seemed unlikely, although not impossible, or it mediated through its effect on malaria to have a direct effect on causality due to bacteremia. And we spent a lot of time thinking about how to design a study. The obvious thing was to go and do it somewhere else where there wasn't much malaria, but that was going to be very expensive. And as we sort of kept thinking about it and talking about it, we realised that all around us, nature was doing the experiment for us because, I've, as I've already shown you, malaria was falling steadily over that time. So essentially what it was producing was a Mendelian randomization experiment because if the explanation is that sickle cell trait protects against bacteremia through an effect on malaria, then as malaria falls away, the protective effect of sickle cell trait on bacteremia will also fall away. If it's a direct effect, then it won't. And this is what happens. So this is what this shows over the period of time that we're talking about is a yearly case control study to look at the protective effect of sickle cell tray on bacteremia due to major pathogens. One is no effect at all. So down here in the 1990s or beginning of 2000s, you've got a very strong protective effect of sickle cell tray against bacteremia. As malaria falls, that effect is lost completely. So the only explanation, unless someone can, up with, can come up with an alternative for this, <laughs> is that it really is mediated through malaria. Um, that the, 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 the Susceptibility to bacteremia in a large proportion of children in endemic area is directly causally related to exposure to malaria. And in fact, malaria may cause, but genuinely cause, 50% of cases of bacteremia. I.e., you have that sort of counterintuitive conclusion that malaria may kill more children by bacteremia than it does by malaria. Because you don't have to have malaria. These are not children who've got malaria at the time. You don't even have to be parasitized at the time. This is some sort of effect of being exposed to malaria on bacteremia. It makes a good story 
But you kind of think, no, that can't, it really can't be true. It can't have that big an effect. But there are some really interesting data from Bioko. Again, back <coughs> over to West Africa now. Now, Bioko had a massive malaria problem. And I've quickly summarised here some, some, basically from the year 2000 down to 2008. Um, it was decided that to mount a massive control effort against malaria on Bioko. So shown here by year, and then by sort of summing it up, this is 2000 to 2003, 2004 to 2008, and this is childhood mortality, very high childhood mortality, 157 per thousand, typical of West Africa rather than East Africa, uh, up to uh, nearly 190 per thousand. And the striking thing here is that in the period where massive control was brought in. It was brought in actually in 2004. So prior to that, very high childhood mortality. After that, extraordinary reduction. I mean, two thirds just dropped from 157 on average per thousand to 55. But the most extraordinary thing about this is it all happened in one year. It happened when malaria was suddenly got on top of. And if you, I cannot think of a more direct, as it were, supportive evidence that if you really get on top of malaria, everything else changes in a way completely out of proportion to what you would have expected simply from the effect of malaria as a pathogen in the population. <coughs> so it's been great news up to now. Uh, malaria is going down, mortality is going down, spending has gone up, it's all fantastic. So I'm not normally a person to finish on a sort of more pessimistic note, so I don't regard this as pessimistic, but I think it's important to finish on a realistic note. So the last couple of slides are sort of it were other things that we need to be aware of that are going on. The first is artemisinin and resistance, which has appear, appeared in the Greater Mekong. It was, it was noted in 2006, but we now think it probably emerged around about 2001. Um, and shown here are the areas of the Greater Mekong where there is artemisinin resistance split into the so-called tiers, tier one, tier, tier two, tier three, tier three is where there isn't any. I won't go into detail about this, just simply to say artemisinin resistance is emerging. This will be an absolute catastrophe if it, if it, if it expands beyond there. Um, there, are, there are major efforts at control and recently the Malaria Policy Advisory Committee um, of WHO has recommended that the hard that will be there has to be an attempt to eliminate malaria completely in the Greater Mekong. Um, it seems impossible that, to control artemisinin resistance otherwise. If this were to spread, as chloroquine resistance did and as SP resistance did, it will be an absolute disaster. This is insecticide resistance. Again, I won't go into the details of what the map means. You can guess what it means. The sort of darker the colours, the worse it is. In fact, the darkest colours is where there's resistance to four different classes of insecticide. Right across the malaria world, and particularly right across Africa, wherever there are data, there's insecticide resistance and it's getting worse rapidly. So what we're seeing is the two things which we depend on completely to keep malaria under control, drugs and um, anti-vector agency, are both threatened by resistance. And this is, uh, this is a terrifying prospect. Finally, a cautionary tale. Um, again, Chris made reference to this, the idea that malaria may become an epidemic situation even in Africa. Well, you've seen this, by now you're familiar with it. This is severe malaria in Khalifi Hospital going down over the years. And what we, on the next figure, I'll show you a, a sort of an average of this, as it were, for, uh, average the years out and then within a year, probably easier to show you than to try and tell you without seeing it. Um, so, so this is for any average year, as it were. The red line is the average monthly number of severe cases over a period of 15 years before the big drop in malaria. And what you can see is that some years uh, during that period, 1999, but on, there was a lot of malaria, even more than the average. So the average by month, January, February, March, so on, the average is the red line. 1999, we had a massive amount of malaria. By 2009, 10 years later, as I've shown you, Malaria had pretty much gone down to 10% of what it used to be. So there's the historical expected numbers, there's the actual numbers. And this was all going on very nicely until 2011-12, when suddenly in the short rains we had a massive resurgence up to historical levels. And the difference here was this was in children 
not three, four, and five, but children eight, nine, ten. We're having deaths due to multisystem disease in ten-year-old children. This is a population which has lost its immunity, and then you get, for some reason, some minor change and a massive epidemic with deaths in older children. And this is the situation that we're storing up right across Africa right now. So it's a, it's a paradox. We want transmission to go down. It's good that it's going down. But if it goes down and we don't get right on top of it and stay right on top of it, we're going to start seeing massive epidemics of malaria in older children and adults eventually in Africa. So in 2015, where are we? Well, there's lots of good news. Uh, malaria is falling in many, not all, but many parts of Africa and the rest of the world. Uh, there are really disproportionately good gains in child survival from that. And there's been enormous renewed optimism um, and, you know, and, and thoughts of eradication, in fact a big push towards eradication in many people's thinking. And there are new interventions. I haven't talked at all about malaria vaccines, but, there's, but, but there are new interventions coming along. Um, a, a malaria vaccine will be registered this year. Um, there are new drugs in the pipeline. There are new vector control approaches possibly in the pipeline. So lots of good news. But there are some cautionary things to think about. Artemisinin resistance, insecticide resistance. Perhaps most worrying of all is flat and insufficient funding. I made a big point about funding having gone up by a log order, but it's still only roughly half of what we cost we would need to simply apply the interventions we've got now. That's not thinking of anything in the future. So we've done well, but we're still only halfway there. And in the current sort of world economic climate, I'm not sure what the chances of doubling to just over 5 billion a year are. Now, 5 billion a year in relation to many other things in the world is not such a massive amount, but whether it could really be achieved and, and maintained for 20 years, I'm not sure. And there are large populations with reducing immunity, particularly in Africa. So th these are all things that we do need to be concerned about. So finally, a few concluding thoughts. Um, I don't doubt personally that elimination and eradication should be the goal of malaria research and malaria control. But I think it's really important that we recognise that elimination can't even be thought about in any country until you've controlled malaria. That has to be the first priority. And historically, many countries have been right to the brink and then fallen back because of the failure to maintain or, or interventions or because of problems, biological problems with the interventions. Um, there is a new global technical strategy which will come out next year from WHO and a new global malaria action plan and they'll both be launched together in a coordinated way in 2015 and this is positive, we need to be aware of that. And more than anything, I think, is the fact that global funding has to be first increased and then sustained at that increased level and new tools need to be developed. Um, and I see no reason why that can't happen. There's a lot of investment going into new tools. I, I think chances for new vaccines, new drugs are really extremely good, so I don't think we should be at all negative about that. But I think funding is the key issue here. So I've tried to present a balanced view of the last 30 years or so. Overall, there's been a lot of optimism, but I think it would be wrong to be foolishly optimistic. And I think it's really important that we're realistic about the threats that we face now. But there is something we need to do about it, and that is maintain and increase the advocacy for funding, because without that, things will go in the wrong direction. So thanks very much for asking me to give this talk.